by Dr. T. Narayan Rao. Dr. T. Narayan Rao, he also, like me, did his PhD using the MST radar those days. He is heading now uh, cloud and convection uh, system group. And uh, he is actually not only that group, but his basic strength is, or the area of research is radar meteorology with you know, deep convection, turbulence, precipitation, cloud, cloud to precipitation, that kind of activity. And uh, I must also mention that uh, he is a fellow of uh, the Indian Academy of Science Bangalore and also uh, Indian National Science Academy called INSA, which is the National Academy uh, in Delhi. Okay? And uh, of course, he is no doubt he is an expert in radar in general radar meteorology with specific focus on uh, cloud precipitation, convection, that kind of system, which includes, of course, the boundary layer processes. So with this, I think I request Dr. Narendra to make uh, his presentation and uh, convey some message and sensitize you people. I to convey quickly, I think. We are already running by late by, I think, one hour or so. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Patra. So, so since morning you are hearing um, talks on uh, radar hardware and also later now signal processing. Okay. So, I am going to cover mostly the, okay, once the data comes, what we can do with the data. Okay. So, what are the applications, radar applications? So, uh, so this is the outline of our presentation. So just I will brush up uh, the fundamentals because I will not go maybe two, three slides I will show and then straight away I will go to the applications. So I divided the applications into two groups. One is operational applications and another is research applications. I mean what kind of research we can do with this data. Okay. Um, so this I think morning someone has shown. If you divide the but all the atmospheric radars into three groups. One group, sorry. One group uh, is the here in this range. What what we could, we are calling as ST, MST radars or clear air radars. Basically, they operate at either UHF frequency or UHF frequency. Since morning, we are hearing about that only. It's called this this type of radars. And there is another uh, branch of radar, another group of radars. They operate at ASC and X band frequencies. They are all Doppler weather radars. So the function of the Doppler weather radars is different. And then there is other type of radars called very high frequency radar. There, I mean, there's a uh, uh, this K band and millimeter wavelength. So they are all for clouds, studying clouds. Okay. So they are all all atmospheric radars. If you divide into three groups, uh, this is the group actually we are now discussing. So this also morning, uh, I think Dr. Dogara has shown. So now we are talking about what are our targets for these radars. What are the targets? Okay. Uh, in morning he has discussed when you don't have any disturbed weather, there is no cloud, no rain. Still you are getting echo. That echo is coming from the changes in the refractive index because the radio wave propagates. If there is a change in the refractive index, the atmosphere and there will be some scattering, some refraction, everything happens. Thus the scattered component is what, that's what comes back to the radar and that we will process it and then we will get the required parameters, whatever parameters we were interested in. Okay. So uh, morning anyway he has discussed and there is, assume that there is a rain or cloud within the radar uh, volume. Then you also get a course from the rain drops or cloud drops. Okay. So that is a different type of scattering, it's called particle scattering. He also explained in the morning, rally scattering and mist scattering. So these two basic, uh, for clear air scattering we will use, I mean these uh, clear, clear air backscattered echoes we will use for profiling of winds and some other uh, applications. And then particle scatter we basically will use to study the uh, clouds, rain and other stuff. Okay, so this is the morning. Uh, Dr. Durgara and also Dr. Anandan has shown one big plot. Okay, where you are seeing height, Doppler, 
and then at all heights you are getting the Doppler uh, shifted echo. So if you take only at one height, it looks like this. Okay, not at all heights, maybe at one one height. So what is that you are seeing here? There is a spectral density and then Doppler velocity, and this is zero. So how much it is shifted from the zero? That is the Doppler velocity. From there you can calculate the winds. Okay, and then the the spread of this this one, this your echo, tells you the uh, the intensity of the turbulence. So and then uh, this so that's why I have written these are the basic parameters you are getting from any radar. One is the Doppler shift, the spectral width, and backscattered power. So the backscattered power tells you about the the target properties. Some, what is the, the, the target is strong, weak, like that. And then the Doppler shift gives you wind velocity, and then the spectral width gives you the intensity of the turbulence, and also some of the things. Sometimes we can also cal uh, we can also say that whether atmosphere is stable or unstable, like that. Okay. So remember that you, what you are getting is from any from this type of radars. So these are the parameters you are getting. Wind velocities you are getting three components of the wind velocity U, V, W, or, or in other words, zonal wind, meridional wind, and vertical wind. Okay, and what happened? Okay, uh, and also the turbulence intensity. Okay, from the uh, clear air scattering. So, uh, like I told that the applications section I divided into operational applications. Research applications. So these are the, I have given a big list, but I'll show one one example of each one. So now the radars, this this type of radars you have seen at several places. There people are talking about different different several radars they have shown. So some it's, it's in some countries they have networked this type of radars. Not such a big big radars, but a small, smaller version of these radars, uh, like NOAA. Then this in Europe. In Japan, Japan is much smaller uh, radar, like boundary layer radars. But basically, what they are doing is they are getting continuous wind information, and that continuous wind information they are trying, they are putting into the models and then trying to improve the weather forecast. So that is that is one of the main application uh, people are using now. And then there are some good publications. Actually, one it came in the. Uh, Cover page of the Bulletin of American Math Society. This talks about the value of wind profiler data, uh, and then they have seen that uh, there is a good improvement in the uh, short range weather wind forecast and also in other parameters. So that's why, of course, now it is not being used, but uh, still in uh, Europe and then Japan, they are using these uh, wind profiler networks. Then there are what is other things for aviation industry. So aviation, you all might have experienced those who have fly, uh, traveled in airplane. A lot of turbulence will be there. It's called clear air turbulence. When the flight goes and then it completely shakes sometimes. So that clear air turbulence information that you can directly measure, I mean, you can measure with this kind of radar. Okay? And then the other one is, is called microburst. So these are the two important processes close to the, if microburst happens close to the airport or at the time of landing, most particularly at the time of landing, it is very, very dangerous. So that's why in many airports, they keep this kind of small, small radars, uh, which will be useful to tell whether uh, this kind of microburst is existing or not. Okay. So this is the microburst because... Uh, I don't know any of how many of you understand how the uh, this convective process happens when a when a cumulonimbus cloud. I think you might have heard about the cumulonimbus cloud. When a cumulonimbus cloud is there, when it dies, when it dies just before it dies, there will be a strong downdraft will be there. So that strong downdraft comes and hits the ground and then goes like this, okay, and then goes like a cold front there. So there, those things when a flight goes in this way that suddenly it experiences a draft, down draft, a draft like that. So it will be very difficult for the pilot to adjust to where those kind of things. And then, in fact, in, uh, in India, one accident happened, one minister died. So that is, the people say that is Kumar Mangalam uh, died because of the airplane crash, because of this kind, because the flight has gone into this microburst. Okay? Then another application is wind support. Today morning, uh, director has shown that 
we are providing wind data to upper air wind data to shar center okay so it's not only the wind so what we do is there are other applications are also for uh, uh, rocket launch support rocket launches so you can see here what we do is launch time is here i have shown one example from uh, old data launch is here so we operate the radar actually a few hours before the launch every one hour we take the measurements and then just close to the launch actually we take we increase the frequency of the measurement and we continuously send this data because when a rocket goes they will feed wind information so the rocket is going to experience this kind of wind okay that data that needs to be fed uh, that into the algorithm so the rocket i mean that they should know that how the uh, how much load is going to come on the rocket so they will adjust it accordingly but the problem is there really is a balloon radio sound you all know no radio sound so it gives wind information so they release actually says our radio sounds are construct but that it happens one and a half hour before the rocket launch but in one and a half hour from that one and a half hour to actual rocket launch how the wind is changing that they don't know okay so then if suddenly wind increases or suddenly wind decreases then that information is not known so the wind persistence that is they won't have that information okay so then they depend on us so we continuously provide that information to them uh <coughs> then there is another program called reusable launch vehicle program rlv okay they, so for that program so the once the rocket goes and then it comes back like an airplane so for that to design that and then to know that what is the kind of vertical wind we get in our conditions in atmosphere in our in indian conditions that they want they actually that they don't know they cannot take out somebody else data also so and here has provided that information we have collected several uh, convective storms and then finally we have seen the vertical wind is going up to 10 to 15 meter per second the uh, such a strong vertical wind normally it is of the order of few centimeter per second but in such a strong convection it can go up to 15 20 meter per second okay so all this information is very, very was very useful in designing the uh, the reusable launch vehicle and also then when it comes back like an airplane uh, this this kind of information is very very useful uh, recently also <coughs> they asked us so they were uh, see when the rocket goes they will keep some uh, margins wind uh, per wind because you know with the wind but still they will keep some margin extra margin so they were using some 9 meter per second margin they call it as a gust gust means a sudden change in the wind okay so that for that actually they were using some 9 meter per second but then what we did is we conducted several experiments and then we reduced that gust magnitude from 9 meters to 7 meter per second so because of that a lot of fuel was saved or in other ways the payload weight can we can increase it otherwise earlier they were only keeping the fuel for that to adjust that 9 meter per second but because of the reduction uh, there is a lot of uh, useful uh, i mean they, they they can change the payload weight also uh, <coughs> there is another application it's called air quality meteorology so morning i think dr patra was mentioning about that see okay this is a kind of a reactor and then near to the reactor also we have wind profilers in, in majority of these uh, atomic energy plants or then this kind of things no they keep some they want to know two things they always release some uh, effluents into the uh, into the atmosphere but they will make sure that it will not come towards the land it will go towards the sea okay so they want to know two uh, in fact so two pro, uh, parameters they want to know what is the wind speed i mean what is the wind speed and wind direction and the other one is the turbulence information okay so wind speed wind direction tells them that in which direction this whatever dangerous gas they are emitting in, in which direction it is going and the second turbulence tells you the information turbulence gives an indication that how quickly it is mixing with the background wind okay if it mixes with the background wind then there will not a problem so that's why that is the two information and then wind profiler provides both the information wind speed wind direction it is giving 
and also turbulence information is giving. That's why they always keep a small, okay, a soda or a radar, something they, they always keep that. When it comes to research applications, uh, these kind of radars are used starting from atmospheric boundary layer to media, uh, for the, uh, this kind of turbulence, stratosphere, troposphere exchange and also cloud to study the clouds and precipitation or rain. Okay? So, um, I was telling that actually uh, somebody, all these people told that they know about the radio sound. So, what is the advantage of wind profile? A radio sound is also giving wind profile. So, the main advantage of this wind profile or radar is, this kind of radar is, you will get continuous wind information. Every two minutes or three minutes you can get a wind profile. Whereas, the radio sound gives only once or two, uh, depending on, uh, in some countries it is only one ascent, in some countries it is two ascents per day, morning and evening. But whereas this is continuous wind information, you see, uh, how the wind is changing in two days here uh, during the passage of some cyclone. Okay? So, if you want to understand the small scale processes or mesoscale scale processes, uh, this kind of radar is very, very useful. Okay? And whereas if you have only two ascents or one ascent per day, you will get one ascent here, one ascent there and you don't know what happened in between. Whereas this kind of radars will give continuous wind information so that way you can see the how the wind is changing uh, and with that uh, you can also study how the what is the diurnal uh, cycle in the wind how the wind changes in a day for example you see here we all think that it will sing similarly at all the heights you see here uh, in the this is at the surface surface you see a wind maximum during the daytime and then but uh, if you go a little bit up around 0.5 kilometers or so it shifts to the early morning here and then uh, this early morning peak is there up to 2 kilometer and then again it shifts to evening. So uh, as you go this is a height a different because we have several instruments so we can construct from surface to 20-25 kilometer. So uh, how the wind maximum is ch changing from from surface to uh, something like the 6 kilometer it has changed peak at least uh, at 2 3 times. Okay. So, this kind of information only, this kind of radars only, uh, this kind of radars only prov can provide. Um, see, for example, and here another uh, uh, interesting thing. See, uh, balloon, let us say balloon, uh, radio sound if you are taking the data. So, you think that the radio sound, uh, is normally we launch around uh, 17 hours, so it will be launched from somewhere around, around that time. And you see the wind maximum is around 2.5 to 3 kilometer. Okay? But actually the wind maximum comes around 1.5 to 2 kilometer in the early morning here. Not even, but if you are using a balloon here, you think that it is at a slightly higher altitude and the magnitude is also completely underestimated. So you don't get the complete information about the wind field uh, if you are using only one ascent or two ascents like that. So this is this radar is having all these capabilities and then you can get this information very nicely. So I am sorry actually I wanted to fill some of these things actually that is missing. So the, what is the advantage of having continuous wind measurements apart from understanding the diurnal cycle and other things. So this you see this convection happened here and it you see these waves atmospheric waves positive negative positive negative positive negative. So the, they are the atmospheric waves. So, this kind of convection can trigger these atmospheric waves and then they propagate into the atmosphere and they carry the energy and momentum, they deposit there and they change the whole to total circulation. Okay? So, that way these, these waves are very, very important and we can also calculate how much momentum these waves are carrying that also we can calculate uh, with this type of radar. Uh, and then I was telling about the boundary layer process. You can see uh, because we are going to get this data from uh, almost like from from 500 meters or so. You can see the how the boundary layer is evolving with the time. Okay, and then you see the thermals here, up and down winds. 
all this information and then also for wind field. So these are the important parameters in the boundary layer. You want to know the boundary layer height, you can calculate. Uh, this is the boundary layer height. Okay, if you want to know the wind field within the boundary layer, you can cal you can get that information uh, from this. So this is some of the information which is required for the boundary layer studies, and you get all these things with with this kind of radar. And of course, there are several studies, and those who are I don't know whether some people are there uh, working on the this uh, uh, pollution or something. Uh, see, poly for pollution studies, mostly they, they calculate one parameter called ventilation coefficient. It is simply the product of the boundary layer height and the wind speed. And both this, both wind speed and both uh, boundary layer height, both you can get with this radar. So you can directly get this ventilation coefficient, which is very, very useful for the, um, for air pollution studies. Of course, uh, there are several other things, because, uh, the monsoon, when we know the Indian monsoon, you don't get rainfall continuously. So sometimes you get continuous rainfall, we call wet spell, and then there will be a dry spell. You don't get any rainfall during that time. So then what happens when you have when the ground is completely dry, and when other situation is when you have ground is completely wet. There's a lot of soil moisture here. It's a very dry uh, surface there. So how they drive the boundary layer? when this kind of conditions are there, okay? Because the surface is the main forcing mechanism for boundary layer, how they, it drives the boundary layer. So it is completely different. Everybody, earlier also people know that during dry condition, boundary layer goes up a little bit high compared to the wet conditions. But then the evolution of the boundary layer also is different in these two, uh, uh, in these two spells. So that is how we, we have seen that, and then whatever radiation which is coming from the sun, most of the radiation is used to evaporate the moisture during the when the surface is wet. Okay, so instead of driving the boundary layer, uh, <coughs> I told about the atmospheric turbulence. We can measure with uh, with this type of radar. Okay, so why this information is required? I think we have have already told that this is for air pollution. Uh, they want this information. Um, and also aviation people also want this atmospheric turbulence information. But then there are other scientific applications also. For example, in you see this, um, of course this looks like a lines only. But many times what happens, the clouds form, you get rain. Immediately. Some cloud don't, don't give any rain. Okay. So, um, what is happening is everybody knows that actually when a cloud when a cloud drop forms, it forms on the aerosol. But it once it grows to a big size, then it starts falling and then it collects whatever drops are there in between. But from the aero, from the cloud drop formation to this one start descending, there is a large actually uh, gap area is there. They, nobody knows actually what is happening there. How this cloud drop is growing to a a slightly bigger raindrop size and then once it starts falling it is okay everybody knows that it's collision call coalescence and other process dominates but in between these two what is happening nobody knows the turbulence is the one actually which allows uh, more collisions which changes the drops in randomly and then collides uh, 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 enhances the chance of collision and then it increases the collisions and the drop size increases this is how the uh, Turbulence becomes very important in clouds. And of course the stratosphere, troposphere exchange process also, turbulence plays a very, very important role. Now let us see, how do we measure turbulence? I have been telling from the beginning that we can measure turbulence with this radar. Okay? <coughs> and I also told that uh, the, the spread of the spectra, uh, the spectrum, spread of the spectrum uh, gives the, uh, I mean it represents the intensity of the turbulence. If, the, if you have a broader spectrum, the turbulence will be large. If the narrow spectrum, the turbulence will be small, uh, relatively. Okay. But how, how do you, how, 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 you are, how I am telling these things? See, if you see, if the wind is blowing in this direction, let us say there is a, this turbulent motions, I have drawn it in my hand, so uh, you can see this, they are all irregularities, these turbulent motions are there. So, for example, wind is blowing in this direction, because of this wind, there will be a shift from zero to 
depending on the wind speed, it is, uh, spectra will be shifted. But then, for example, when it is coming, this small uh, the eddy, a small irregularity is opposite to the wind direction. So it will, it will this in this place it will reduce the wind speed. Okay, so you will get a slightly lesser wind here, and then in sometimes this is in the direction of the wind. So it will, in this place it will increase the wind. So like that, if all the irregularities, whatever are there, some irregularities will try to reduce the wind, some irregularities will increase the wind. So because of that, there will be a spread in the uh, the spectrum. Okay, so that is how it is related to the turbulence. So if you have more irregularities, then it, it widens the spectra. Okay, but there are other factors which it is not a straight uh, simple thing. There are other non turbulent contributions also which makes uh, the spectra widen. Okay, so th they need to be removed to cal to directly relate the spectra to the turbulence. Okay, so there are several mechanisms. So this is what I have written here. A simple equation. This is the absorbed spectra. So this spectra con uh, contains turbulent contribution, and then there are some other non-turbulent contributions. So these non-turbulent contributions are shown here. Um, but if you can remove, if you can calculate these factors and remove, then you can directly absorb spectra. You can relate it to the turbulence. Okay, there are some several theoretical equations are there, but we don't know whether those equations are theoretically correct. But whether really they are correct or not, we don't know. There are several equations: uh, two beam method, three beam, uh, the single beam uh, things. Are, so many are there. So what we did is because now MS radar, our radar. Uh, Morning, also somebody was asking how to change the beam width. So we we have the flexibility. So we have taken uh, different configurations: uh, one small array, one medium size array, and one big array, and then asymmetric array like that. Several co combinations we have taken, and then we tested. If all those theoretical formulations are correct, we should get the same result. Okay. Otherwise, you will get different different results if it is a random kind of some randomness is there. But what we have seen is before. When we collected, this is, these are the absurd things, and we can see that wherever wind speed is maximum because of this beam broadening, uh, the the, the uh, your uh, spectra is little bit uh, spectra is larger here, is wider here. But after correction, all of them have shown same values. So the theoretical formulations, whatever we are using in the from the literature, they are all correct. Actually, that experiment tells about that. Then another important uh, <coughs> property of this uh, this backscattered echoes, uh, VHF backscattered echoes, is actually the aspect sensitivity. Uh, we we were, we were morning we and then also when I have shown some uh, slide where we are talking about three scattering mechanisms, um, backscatter, Fresnel reflection, like that. In that. One property is aspect sensitivity means actually when you point the beam vertically, you will get the mag because you will get the reflection, so you will get the maximum backscatter. If there is a very uh, kind of a layered target is there, like a uh, simple example is you just throw a ball towards the wall, you will get the ball back to you. But if you throw a ball with some angle, it goes somewhere else, isn't it, with that angle. So it is simple like that. When you are pointing the beam vertically, if you have a layer type of uh, target is there, then you will get the maximum backscatter. But if you point in some direction, the maximum reflection will go somewhere else. You will get only the small scattered component. So by looking at the, the backscattered power differences between these two, we can say whether that layer, whether that kind of layer type of echo is there or not. Okay? Those layer type of echoes are formed mainly because of the, wherever the temperature inversion is there. So from there we can say that this atmosphere is highly stable there because instead of temperature decreases there is an increase in the temperature. Uh, so then stable layer is there, pre is present there. So because of that actually we are getting this kind of backscatter. So we can identify in the atmosphere the stable layers where the stable layers are present. Okay. So because why we need to stay, we should, we want to know the stable layers are there or not because when the stability is high then the clouds will not grow 
okay so st the stably uh, this st the atmosphere when atmosphere is stable cloud it prohibits the growth of the cloud okay so that information also we can get and the another important uh, application of this is we can also identify the tropopause okay so tropopause is the layer between the strato troposphere and the stratosphere so where exactly the tropopause because tropopause itself is this kind of a stability starts from there so we can identify the stable uh, tropopause uh, with the same technique here so we can study uh, the exchange between the troposphere and stratosphere once we have the tropopause information uh, one of the most important advantage of this this kind of radar is it provides vertical wind because no other instrument because radio sound gives only horizontal wind it doesn't give vertical wind the other instruments also will provide only horizontal wind this is the only instrument which provides vertical wind all the time even clear air disturbed weather all the time okay so there is a kind of a hypothesis the most of the exchange between the troposphere and stratosphere happens in uh, two regions um, in, the, in the indian region and then there is a kotata bend in the, in the in this 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 kind in this region okay pacific uh, region so then uh, what happened is actually we have fortunately one radar here and one radar here so what we did is uh, we estimated the vertical wind we wanted to see that whether really the exchange is happening only in these two places they call stratospheric fountains so like air is going like a fountain in from this region in these two regions to the into the stratosphere whether that hypothesis is true or not we wanted to check we wanted to check so when we calculated the uh, wind climatological background wind we always saw that negative uh, downdraft here so it indi clearly tells us that really i mean the, the kind of hypothesis is not true then after that there is another hypothesis came cold trap hypothesis so this actually is agreeing with our measurements okay so we can check the the kind of this kind of hypothesis whether they are true or not or we can also generate a new hypothesis here okay <clears throat> so far i talked about only the the clear air portion that uh, whenever a clear uh, the um, the clear air echoes what we can do with clear air echoes clear air back scattered like a back scattered echo or frontal reflected echo now uh, i'll talk about the rally scattered echo because we have seen that a vhf radar when uh, with vhf radar you get two echoes when rain is there during rain time you get two echoes one echo uh, comes from uh, uh, one echo comes from the background uh, refractive index changes other one comes from the rain particle itself okay so whereas at a uhf radar we have another uh, high frequency like uh, uhf radar high, ultra high frequency radar uh, operates at 1.3 gigahertz so when you with this radar because you see the rally scattering the lambda is small you will get a strong back scatter so you you see only the uh, precipitation echo not the clear air echo okay so the only this echo only one echo you will get as the frequency increases you get only one echo at vhf you get both the echoes but the problem here is how do we say segregate these two echoes because sometimes they are very close okay so this kind of problems are there of course now we have developed some new techniques to Uh, segregate these two echoes and then calculate the parameters but just like i told that the three parameters back scatter power uh, the velocity the radial velocity and the spectral width in a clear air condition what they correspond to and in precipitation during whatever echo you are getting from the precipitating particle so the back scatter power if you can calibrate it we can directly get the reflectivity morning somebody was asking dbz Uh, reflectivity in dbz okay so you can directly get that and you can calculate the, uh, the you can calculate rain rate also from that and then there is another application is because back from back scatter power we can also classify i mean it will be useful to classify the precipitation what type of rain it is is it a convective rain is it a stratiform rain or is it a mixed type of rain um uh, then the mean doppler velocity gives uh, information about the because once you have this velocity and this velocity so you can also actually calculate the what is the fall velocity of the raindrop 
and from there, uh, from the spectrum width, we can also calculate the one of the most important parameters called raindrop size distribution. So you can get a vertical distribution, vertical actually profile of raindrop size distribution. At each height, how many drops are of, of uh, what size is available. So the distribution of the raindrops you can get. Once you have that information, you can uh, you will understand uh, the the rain processes in a much better way. Uh, <coughs> so this is uh, one important uh, study. Um, uh, this is one of the important factor. Actually, I told you that um, we can use this radar to classify precipitating systems. What type of precipitating system it is? So for that, actually, people use whether radar breadband is present or not. If bad radar breadband is present, then they call it as stratiform rain. If it is, uh, otherwise, if a strong reflectivity is there, then they call it as a convective rain. Okay. So the radar breadband is very very useful because for several applications, like uh, lot of attenuation of millimeter waves happens during the, in the in, the, in this uh, um, breadband, and also of course people we have to avoid the this breadband for the estimation of rainfall and then several other applications because this is where uh, maximum latent heat of cooling occurs in the atmosphere. So this is mainly formed because of the aggregation of high particles and then there is a phase change because above that it is yeah, everything will be in ice phase. Be, once it crosses the zero degree it becomes uh, water, I mean raindrop. But that's why it, because of it takes a lot of heat from the atmosphere it becomes like atmosphere becomes <coughs> Uh, atmosphere gets cool there. So there are a lot of things are there. So we can study all these things in very high resolution. Now we can study this breadband with 37.5 meter. I mean with our radar. We can study with 37.5 meter resolution we can study this uh, breadband. So earlier people used to get around 300-400 meter. The thickness of the breadband itself is around 600 meter. So you get hardly get they go to 1.2 points like that within that breadband. But now we can study 37.5 meter, 600 kilometer thickness, you can study very nicely. <coughs> um, another thing that we can study is actually the, the, the information about the convection. Okay? Convective drafts. One of the application I already told that in the, uh, for the rocket, this uh, reusable launch vehicle program, they asked us to provide this vertical wind information, we have given that. But we can characterize the convective storms. You see, the some of these storms are not really uh, vertical yet because of the strong background wind. They are always, most of the time, you see the kind of tilted uh, storm. Of course, it depends on the location, but uh, at our place, actually, most of the storms are tilted in nature. Uh, it's not vertically oriented, even uh, most of the storms. And then, of course, we have studied what is the, you can also, you can always study the, what is the magnitude of the uh, or intensity of the storm, what is the lifetime of the storm, what is the height, vertical extent of the storm, all these things we can study uh, with this kind of radars. So this is what actually shown and then of course in different uh, spells like I told you, wet and dry spells, how they are different, the, uh, the, the storms, the vertical extent as well as the intensity. And you can see very nicely here, uh, in wet spells normally you see very strong convection and then that's why you see only one peak at the, in the petroposphere, in the vertical wind. But whereas in the dry spell you don't see that kind of one thing, it's a bimodal structure you see. So that means what is happening is in dry spell convection, a storm forms, a shallow form, shallow cell, it evaporates and that provides energy for the next storm. So it's not a one storm, actually it's two storms forms. So that kind of structure you will get in the, in the dry spell. So this is the kind of information you can get with this. Uh, with, with this radar. And of course, as I told you that since this is the only instrument which provides a vertical wind, so you can test all your numerical models, outputs, whether whatever output you are getting, the numerical models, whether really model is able to reproduce this kind of vertical wind or not. So we can test all these things because this is the instrument which is directly giving that information and then models also you can test. Of course, the several studies have been carried out to test the, uh, the vertical wind given by the models correct or correct or not. Uh, like I also I already told that we can get the vertical profile of raindrop size distribution. Okay, so in a cloud, uh, from formation to the 
whatever you see as a raindrop, several microphysical processes occurs. You don't realize these things, but then several things occurs. But if you have this kind of information, um, vertical profile of raindrops or distri distribution, you can actually uh, you can you can you can pinpoint that what kind of processes are happening, which are giving this kind of distribution, which are responsible for this kind of distribution at different heights. What microphysics is happening? Okay, so that we can um, we can we can uh, we can derive from 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 this from this kind of distribution. And there is actually there are several instruments which are they are claiming that they are giving vertical they are giving DSD vertical DSD but there are so they create so many problems so actually uh, these papers are talking about those things. Uh, I'll skip some of these things. I'll come to the last slide. <coughs> now, now I think uh, morning here director has shown this. Um, that we have started uh, a program uh, where actually these five radars were operated simultaneously and then we have collected a lot of data, some campaigns we have conducted and then uh, at that time of course the Harin data radar was not fully functional uh, but now it is fully functional I am happy that it is fully functional now and then we, now we are planning again in this winter some more campaign, one more campaign we are planning. Uh, I think we all, you are all welcome to participate in these programs and then these radars as a standalone radar also they can provide lot of information also in the, this kind of network mode also we can study several large scale processes okay so anyway thank you <coughs>